In my working life, I am ignored. I'm ridiculed and tested to my limit on a daily basis. And yet, I love what I do. I'm a teacher in a pupil referral unit for young people who have been permanently excluded from mainstream schools. For 25 years, I've worked with all kinds of different young people, most of whom have challenging behaviour. And I'm here today to be a voice for them, because their real needs lying beneath the behaviour all too often go unseen, unheard and unmet. Now, these children are easy to dislike. They challenge our authority as adults. They disobey us and disrespect us. They can make us feel out of control and sometimes scared, like we're failing, incompetent and powerless. In short, they can make us feel like they feel, and it is unbearable. So in our schools, we prefer them to go away and be someone else's problem. But these are our most vulnerable and disadvantaged young people in our society. And they need our help and expertise the most. And yet we're failing them on a huge scale. Over the last three years in schools in England, we've seen a 40% increase in permanent exclusions. 40%. And in 2016, there were over 6,500 permanent exclusions. And the estimated cost of this over the lifetime of that one group is estimated to be over £2 billion. What we know about excluded children is that they're more likely to live in poverty, more likely to experience abuse and neglect at home. They're seven times as likely to have a learning difficulty, special educational need. And over half of them are experiencing some form of mental health related condition. Ultimately, excluded children go on to make up over 60% of our British prison population. And they're not just other people's children. They could be yours or they could be mine. Like the 15 year old girl, who helped to nurse her mum until she went into a hospice, who struggled to cope when her dad moved his girlfriend into the home. And then one day at school, she was walking down the corridor and another pupil made a really cruel comment about her dying mum. And she lashed out and found herself permanently excluded. Not long after that, she went into care. And I later learned that by the time she was 18, she'd become involved in prostitution. I firmly believe that with the right support, her life could have taken a very different path. Just imagine if she'd been your child. What would you have hoped for her? And what would her mum have wanted? We human beings are wonderfully diverse, but our needs are fundamentally the same. And our need for human connection is the most important. Dr. Brené Brown says, connection is why we're here. It's what gives our lives meaning and purpose. And studies have shown that the happiest people have the most positive human connections. So when connections unravel, so too does our ability to cope with everyday life. And for children with challenging behaviour, they've often become disconnected. They've lost their faith in adults and any sense of security that they had. And if they could do well at school, they'd be doing it. But there are barriers standing in the way. There are reasons. And then it's never, ever simply that the child doesn't want to. But knowing there are reasons doesn't help our mainstream teachers in their incredibly difficult jobs. Challenging behaviour in our classrooms creates anxiety, causes disruption to learning, and together with workload, it's one of the main reasons teachers give for their own mental health-related absence. And ultimately, why some teachers leave the profession altogether. And this is where the ideas and approaches and expertise that staff use in pupil referral units and other alternative provision could be so useful if it was extended and utilised in mainstream schools. What my colleagues and I know is that without a significant relationship, we can't achieve a single thing. 
These children won't like us and respect us and do as we say simply because we're adults and teachers. Adults have often let them down, so we have to prove ourselves worthy of their trust. We have to earn it. Now, fortunately for society as a whole, most children follow rules. But it's been shown time and again that children with challenging behaviour follow people first and rules second. Put simply, if they like us, they'll feel safe. And if they feel safe, they'll relax. And if they relax, they're more likely to comply and to learn. I've asked countless pupils, young people, what do you think makes a good teacher? And their responses are typically the same. They say things like, the ones who are strict, but that you can still have a laugh with, or the ones that seem interested in getting to know you, or ones that treat you like you're a human being. I asked one young man in my pupil referral unit this question recently. And he said, I never thought about that before, miss. Just give me a sec. I gave him a sec, and I waited. And eventually he said, right, get on to this, miss. I think that teachers, good teachers, are ones that you can have like a, oh, oh, you know, like a proper bond with. Do you know what I mean? I told him I knew exactly what he meant. So is it possible for mainstream teachers to build connections with challenging pupils? I believe this requires a shift in thinking towards a greater sense of collective responsibility for these children. Now, many of us know that our current educational environment does nothing to encourage this. Schools are primarily rewarded on academic results. They're actually incentivized to exclude pupils. Ofsted inspections make no separate judgment about outcomes for children with special needs and those with challenging behavior. And newly qualified teachers often report that they're unprepared for how to teach these children. But there are things that teachers can do in the meantime. The teacher and author, Paul Dix, says, it's the small stuff. It's the daily acts of care. It's the perpetual generosity of spirit and the interest you show in their daily lives that matters most. Small things that can have a huge impact. And we shouldn't underestimate the ripple effect that one positive teacher-pupil relationship can have. There is nothing more beautiful to me than hearing one pupil that I've spent some time with say quietly to another pupil that's struggling to settle, Nah, bro, leave it out. This is sound. Collective responsibility is where it starts. But if we want pupils with challenging behaviour to learn how to behave, we have to teach them explicitly and not just expect them to get it. And this is where restorative approaches to behaviour can be so useful. Now, these are not hug it out alternatives at the opposite end of the bring back the birch argument. Rather, they are tried and tested approaches designed to reinforce relationships. And they explicitly teach missing skills, like how to reflect on consequences, like how to develop empathy and a conscience. And they instill in pupils the expectation that reparation needs to happen. Detentions, time out, Exclusions and isolation do none of this. And we've got plenty of evidence now that shows that our current systems of punishments and sanctions are ineffective with challenging pupils. The head teacher and author, Jarlath O'Brien, says of fixed term exclusions that they are inaction, masquerading as action. They make us feel like we're doing something when we're doing nothing of the sort. It is respite, it is not improvement. So we need a new way forward if we're going to meet the needs of the most vulnerable and disadvantaged pupils in our society. Because while the world is full of tragic stories that we're helpless to do anything about, we can do something about outcomes for these children. So let's take collective responsibility and let's make connections. Let's share our expertise and integrate the best ideas. We should question and challenge an inspection system and a culture that ignores them. How can that be right? 
And we should never forget that children with challenging behavior are just children, doing their best to deal with what life has handed to them without any of our adult skills. And if they could tell you what they need, they would probably say something like, don't be scared of me. Please don't give up on me. Make me feel I'm important and give me hope that things can and will get better. Please see past my behavior. It's not who I really am. So I'm joining with them today in their challenging behavior to try to get their needs met, albeit in a more socially appropriate way. And I invite you to do the same. The only difference between all of us and the children I speak on behalf of is luck, education, and opportunities like this one. Let's make a difference. Thank you.